Recently, I was working on a secret project and for it, I needed some information about the infamous story. But upon looking for a complete story of the series, all I could find were very quick recaps that skipped over quite a bit. And suddenly, the idea hit me that if I could not find the thing I was looking for, then others might be in the exact same situation, and that is how this video was born. Also, for those who might not have even played the infamous games, this video is a great way to get you familiar with the characters and story without having touched them at all. I will be going over all the main infamous titles, trying to follow the games as they unfold so that those unfamiliar can still maybe get the same feelings that I got when there are twists in the story. And also, quickly before I begin, I ask that you do not like the video and do not subscribe. Just watch, and by the end of the video, I hope that my quality of content will be enough to convince you to do so. So without further ado, let's begin our complete recap of the infamous story. From the beginning of his story, Cole McGrath is shown to be an ordinary guy. He's just a simple bike courier that you wouldn't even look twice at. This is all changed when he unknowingly takes a device called the Ray Sphere in what he thinks is a regular delivery. In this delivery, the device mysteriously explodes, causing a massive burst of energy to erupt in the middle of Empire City's historic district. This initial explosion causes thousands of deaths, but Cole somehow survives, now possessing the power to control lightning. Not fully being able to control this power, he passes out and is then taken to a hospital where for a couple of days, his sort of girlfriend Trish and his best friend Zeke are able to help him. I say sort of girlfriend because the blast killed her sister, and obviously this caused a strain on their relationship. In this time at the hospital, Cole fully heals and gains a small amount of control over his powers. Not all is well though, as we see the effects the blast had over Empire City. Most of the infrastructure is completely gone, causing mass riots with criminals ruling the streets. A mysterious plague has emerged, killing off even more than the blast, and the government completely abandons them by declaring martial law and quarantining the city. Cole then lies low with Zeke because everyone thinks Cole is the sole reason for the blast, even though he was literally just the messenger of some very, very bad news. When Cole and Zeke finally decide to stop laying low, it's for a very good reason. A plane had dropped a supply drop full of food and other supplies that they needed to survive. They eventually arrive at the supply drop and there, Cole has a very important decision to make. He uses powers to help the many or use them selfishly and help himself and Zeke for weeks. To keep things simple for both me and you, I will be going off of the canon ending, which is where Cole decides to be a good guy, unless there is a very notable difference in the evil playthrough, then I will mention it, but for now, I will just be going off of the good playthrough. So let's continue. After selflessly sharing the food with the city, Cole is then introduced to the gang known as the Reapers, who are there to take the food for themselves. After stopping them from doing so, Cole and Zeke finally decide that they need to get out of Dodge and leave the city by helping raid the main bridge out. This attempted escape ultimately fails with both Cole and Zeke jumping off of the bridge, but before falling to his ultimate demise, Cole is saved by a woman named Agent Moya. She states that all of this chaos can be traced back to one secret organization called the First Sons. She then explains that some people have a special mutation called the Conduit Gene, and that a device called the Ray Sphere was designed to draw energy from non-conduits to give powers to individuals who possessed that conduit gene. Moya also says that her husband, John White, has infiltrated the First Sons a while ago, but that he has since gone missing. Finally, Moya proposes a deal. If Cole found a way to find the Ray Sphere and John, she would clear his name in the eyes of the law, allowing him to finally leave the city. Cole then makes his way off the bridge, and Moya makes sure to tell him that she will be keeping close tabs on him. Cole meets back up with Zeke and relays all the information he just learned back to him, but Zeke is very hesitant about giving the government a device that, quote, dishes out powers, and Cole agrees. He then gets a call from Moya, and with her guidance, he finds a dead drop that John had left that explains, at least in part, how John was connected to the First Sons. He also helps power up the rest of the Neon District, and in doing so, he is granted new abilities. Afterwards, Cole helps Trish, and together, they try to find a way to clean the city's water supply of this black tar-like substance that has tainted it. 
In doing so, Cole gets all the tar in his face, and we are introduced to our not so good friend, Sasha. Sasha speaks as if she knows Cole and is jealous of Trish and how much Cole loves her. She also keeps referring to another person indirectly, but for now, Cole has no idea what she is talking about and just assumes that she is crazy. At the end of the mission, Cole destroys a truck that is thought to be the source of the plague and the black tar-like substance that has mind control properties as we have seen with Sasha. Cole then heads home to clear his mind, clean up, and rest, but not long after, he is instructed by Moya to restore main functions to the city, mainly the train. After getting the train up and running, we finally see the city treat Cole like the hero he is, but this high would not last long as Trish informs Cole that the black tar is back in the water supply. Cole must now clear the water towers of tar, and after doing so, he is met face to face by a mysterious man named Kessler. Without hesitation, Kessler leapt towards Cole, digging his cold fingers into Cole's head, and at this point, he was shown visions of a dark future full of pain, suffering, and destruction. Cole had a feeling that Kessler was somehow responsible for all of it, and that the Raysphere had to be involved. And then, just as suddenly as he appeared, Kessler was gone. Afterwards, Cole got yet another call from Moya, who then reveals the truth about Sasha. She was a high-ranking member of the First Sons, and Cole must take her down. Cole travels all the way to a tunnel that connects the Neon and Warren districts of Empire City. While traversing this tunnel, you see how Tar turns normal people into the Reapers that do Sasha's bidding. Cole finally reaches the end of the tunnel, where he finally fights Sasha, trying to get some answers. During this fight, she keeps rambling on about various things, and by the time the fight ends, Cole has a new fear of how his powers might warp him into a twisted mess, just like Sasha. Cole then intends to interrogate her about the First Sons and the Ray Sphere, but suddenly, smoke fills the room. Trained soldiers from the First Sons then take Sasha and leave Cole to exit the tunnel and enter the slums of the Warren District. Cole tells Moya about all of this, and she informs him that the Warren has only gotten worse since the blast. It is now run by the Dust Men, who are led by a man named Alden, a powerful conduit who is not to be messed with. After Cole does various good deeds for both Moya, Trish, and the general public, he goes to rescue Zeke, who was recently kidnapped by Alden. This is because Zeke was jealous of the attention Cole was getting, so he tried to be the hero for once and snuck into a Dust Men compound. After rescuing Zeke and doing some other tasks for Moya, Cole is spoken to by Kessler over the phone. Kessler makes vague remarks about how he has lost everything and how Cole must learn the same lessons he has. Soon after, Trish asks Cole to help her deliver a bus full of supplies to the hospital and Cole happily helps out if it means that it might help mend their relationship. Cole helps escort the bus a very long distance, but eventually they arrive at the hospital where Cole gets his first glimpse of Alden, who shows off his incredible telekinetic power and at the exact same time, Moya finds some information about him. Alden Tate was born into a very wealthy family and from birth he was meant to inherit the power over the first sons. That is, until Kessler showed up and kicked him out to the streets, where he then lived the rest of his angry, miserable, and not so great life. But being a conduit, the race fear changed all of that and he finally got the power to channel his anger, and with the flick of his wrist, he threw the entire bus onto the hospital roof the same bus that Trish was inside. Alden then suddenly disappears, and without a second of hesitation, Cole races up the hospital to save Trish. This very near-death act finally mends their relationship, and at last, they are now on good terms. After some very well-deserved sleep, Cole gets some information from Moya about a raid that the police are conducting to capture Alden. Cole helps them out, and finally, they put an end to Alden's reign and put him behind bars. This doesn't last very long, and after a massive raid on the prison, the Dustmen finally break Alden free. This all takes a massive toll on Zeke, as he was supposed to be the one who was keeping an eye on Alden, but got distracted when he tried to help out Cole. This is the final straw for Cole, and after this moment, the relationship he has with Zeke is colder than ever. But on the bright side, soon after this, Cole got an unexpected call from none other than John White. John, being a very simple and straightforward man, kept his message short. 
He said for Cole to meet him at the top of a very specific building alone, and then he just hung up. Cole relays this information to Moya, who is his wife, and then heads to the agreed upon location. At arrival, John is nowhere to be found, and a helicopter shows up on site. John feels very betrayed by this and seems to think that Cole called the chopper in, but Cole thinks that Moya did it. Moya denies this and says that it's probably the first sons in an effort to capture John again. Regardless, the chopper heads to John's new location, and after chasing it, you find John. The helicopter is then destroyed by one of Alden's trash monster things, and after defeating it, John has yet again left without a trace. Thankfully, he decides to call Cole right after his disappearance and give Cole some answers. He tells him that both of them want the same thing, the Ray Sphere, and that he knows where it is. He says that it's at the top of Alden's tower, a massive building made out of scrap and junk that Alden has created as a testament to his power, influence, and most of all, his ego. John then tells Cole that he needs to have someone he really, really trusts to help collect the Ray Sphere so that when they eventually find it, they can destroy it. Finally, Cole asks what he should tell John's wife, Moya. John seems stunned by this and says that he doesn't have a wife and has never met anyone with the name of Moya. This throws Cole for a loop, and he now has developed a certain level of distrust towards her intentions. Cole thinks of all the people he can trust to collect the race fear and ends up giving Zeke a call. They may not be on the best of terms, but this is Zeke's last chance to make it up to Cole, and really, there's nobody else he can go to anyway. They both begin to ascend the tower, and after a very long climb, they reach the top where Alden and the Ray Sphere are waiting for them. Cole protects Zeke as he begins to tear the Ray Sphere from a device that Alden had built to hold it. After a short battle, it is eventually broken free, and Zeke finally has it in his hands. But at the same time, Kessler arrives to the party. At this moment, Zeke was supposed to make a run for it, and Cole trusted him to do so, but instead, Zeke decided that he would choose to kill thousands in a selfish act to give himself powers, and he activated the Ray Sphere. But then, nothing happened. There was no blast, no powers, nothing. Kessler told Zeke exactly what he wanted to hear and said that he knew exactly what was wrong with the Ray Sphere and how to give Zeke powers. And then Zeke did the unthinkable and followed Kessler, giving him the Ray Sphere in hopes of getting his very own superpowers. This loss of the Ray Sphere caused Alden to go ballistic and he started ripping the tower apart, but Cole, so dumbfounded, he had no time to react and barely felt the impact when he fell to the ground. When eventually awoken, Cole is called by John, who questions his choice to trust Zeke. Cole admits that he made a massive mistake and says that he doesn't trust Zeke anymore and that he might not ever again. John then informs Cole that Alden is on the run to the historic district and to catch up with him immediately before he destroys the whole city. Cole makes his way to the bridge connecting the two districts and while crossing it, he fights and defeats Alden. In his last moments, in a final act of desperation, Alden decides to jump off the bridge he stands on and it is left unclear if he actually died. Cole then travels into the historic district, the exact same area that the blast took place and the home of the First Sons. Immediately after arrival, Cole is instructed to lower the bridge connecting the historic and Warren district. But after doing so, Kessler contacts him and states that he has taken Trish hostage. He's also set up a series of bombs around the city, and if Cole doesn't disable all of the bombs, then Trish dies. But that's not even all, because each bomb also has hostages around it, and Kessler makes it a point to acknowledge that every single person is important. Every single hostage and civilian is important in their own lives. They can be someone's mother, father, sister, or son, but that Cole shouldn't just be saving them because they're important to him, or because it's for saving Trish. He should be saving them because it's the right thing to do for everyone. After disabling a few bombs, Cole is on to his final test that Kessler has set up, to save the one person he loves most, or the many that he doesn't know at all. This takes place on top of two buildings. One has Trish dangling off the edge, and the other has six doctors in the exact same situation. At its most basic, this is the trolley problem on steroids, and Kessler makes sure Cole knows that saving the doctors will also mean saving countless others that they themselves will help. The decision is the players, but seeing as we're going off the good path, Cole makes his way to save the doctors. 
Once you reach the top, it is revealed that Trish was actually one of the six doctors, but sadly, that doesn't mean you get to save her. Right as Cole notices that Trish is actually up with the doctors, Kessler drops her to the ground, and Cole watches as her body hits the pavement. Immediately after, he drops to the ground and he checks her pulse and finds no sign of life. He immediately tries to revive her, but she is just too far past the point where Cole can do any real good, and she's only awoken for a moment, giving her just enough time to tell Cole how proud she is of him and how much she loves him. Cole decides to bury her body in the park alongside the others who died in the blast, and at her grave, he decides once and for all that he is going to kill Kessler the first chance he gets. The next morning, John contacts Cole and instructs him to turn on the power to the Historic District. This gives Cole his final power, the ability to summon lightning from the sky. During this, he also talks to Moya for the final time and basically just tells her to screw off because she lied to him and then Cole hangs up. At this point, the decision to just ghost Moya makes a lot of sense for Cole. He knows that she works for the government and that they probably only wanted Cole to get the race sphere for themselves. On the other hand, John has stated multiple times that he wants to destroy the race sphere just like Cole, and while John hasn't helped Cole a whole lot, he has been very straightforward with him and honest. After restoring power to the historic district, Cole gets a call from John. He states that he has finally found the reason that Kessler took Sasha all the way back in the Neon District. Apparently, the First Sons have been using her to develop a mind control gas that they can disperse throughout the city using massive balloons. Cole is tasked with disconnecting this gas dispersal device from these balloons, and while doing so, he gets a call from Zeke, who isn't with Kessler anymore. Zeke says that he is super sorry about what happened to Trish and that he didn't mean for things to go like this but his apology seemingly fell on deaf ears because Cole decides to just ignore him completely. With all the gas dispersal balloons destroyed, John decides that it's finally time they move to find the race sphere. This is accomplished by destroying cloaked satellite jammers around the city that have been masking its location. John escorts Cole to each jammer location via a platform attached to the bottom of a helicopter. After all the jammers are destroyed, John and Cole both agree that it's finally time to end this by destroying the thing that started it all. The race sphere is being housed in a building that is surrounded by anti-air cannons. This means that John's plan of using a helicopter to drop a bomb and gas the building that it's housed in can't happen unless all the anti-air cannons are destroyed. Cole gets on it, and after destroying them all, John flushes the First Sons out of the building with the gas. Apparently, they weren't fast enough, and the First Sons were prepared for this to happen because just then a truck pulls up beside the building and the race sphere is loaded onto it. Both Cole and John follow this truck all the way to the end of a pier, and here's where Cole makes the important decision to either destroy the race sphere or use it to make himself more powerful. Both decisions have their upsides, but Cole, after thinking about all the harm it has caused, decides to destroy it by hitting it with everything he's got. Unsurprisingly, this causes the opposite effect of what they intended, and when the shell cracked on the race sphere, it caused a vortex of energy that tore John apart and sucked him into it. The implosion then reversed, destroying the entire pier, and any trace of John or the race sphere were turned to ash. Luckily, Cole sensed the impending explosion and got out just in time. He remarks that nothing went according to plan, but at least the race sphere will never fall into the wrong hands again. Kessler then contacts Cole and tells him how disappointed he is in Cole's decision to destroy the race sphere. It could have made him even more powerful than he could have ever imagined, and now he will never get that chance ever again. Cole says that he did what was right for the city and for the greater good of the world, and that it's not about what he needs or what he wants. It's about protecting those who can't protect themselves. Kessler finds this answer amusing, and he tells Cole to make his way to where it all began, so then they can finally finish this. Cole travels all the way to the center of the blast, where he first woke up, where his old life ended, and where his new life began. Kessler shows up, and they fight with both sides using everything they have at their disposal. During this final fight, Kessler also talks to Cole about things in Cole's life that he couldn't possibly know. He talks to Cole about his childhood, and his family, and about Trish. Zeke also comes to help Cole fight, showing that he's willing to put his life in harm's way because he's sorry for how things turned out. 
Kessler sees this and without hesitation throws Zeke to the side and the fight continues. This makes Cole even more determined to beat Kessler and after a while, he finally does it, knocking Kessler to the ground. In his last moments of his life, Kessler whispered something that stunned Cole. He whispered, I love you Trish, please forgive me. He then leapt at Cole and dug his cold fingers into his face, forcing Cole to watch his memories, and in that moment, Cole realized something horrifying. He and Kessler were the exact same person. He saw Kessler's whole life, how he grew up just like Cole, how he got powers from the race sphere, and most of all, how he married Trish with Zeke as his best man. But this was all ruined when something was born. A beast set on destroying all life forced Kessler and his family to flee to safety. But after years, there was nowhere left to go and Kessler lost everything. Then and there, he decided to use his newest and most dangerous ability, a one-way trip back in time to stop all the events that occurred. Here, he took over development of the race sphere, making it even more powerful. He also set up a quarantine and deliberately guided Cole to take the race sphere, and when the time was right, he activated it to make Cole the most powerful person on the face of the earth. Kessler's plan this whole time was to mold Cole into something better, into something ruthless, but also at the same time, a savior for the world to look up to, and he went so far as to kill the woman that they both loved so that Cole wouldn't be tied so heavily by emotions. Kessler then fell back, finally fulfilling his mission he had set out to accomplish. This whole time, he was driven by his guilt. He let a world die because he wasn't strong enough to leave his family and stop the beast. But Cole, Cole wouldn't let all that go to waste, because even as much as he hated Kessler, he knew what was needed. Right then and there, Cole decided that he would prepare for this beast, and when it arrived, he would be ready. The infamous comic series published by DC Comics is where the infamous story continues as it fills the gap between the first and second infamous games, and it ties up some loose ends along with setting up some future events, so here we go. Jumping back before the first infamous game, we find that Moya was actually working with Kessler and the First Sons in the end of the Race Sphere's development. At that time, a man named David was exposed to the power of the Race Sphere dozens of times during testing. Seeing as each time the Race Sphere is used, new abilities are unlocked, David had become a monster of sorts and is now very, very powerful. Jumping all the way to the present, we see how the events of the first game have affected Cole. He is struggling to grasp the fact that he and Kessler are the same person and what that means for his self-identity. He tells all of this to Zeke and even though their relationship is very fractured, it is not completely beyond repair. Cole is then contracted by Warden Harms, the warden of the prison in the Warren District, to flush out the rest of the First Sons from their final location at Pier 12. At the same time, Moya, in the present day, has begun collecting the leftover experiments and conduits from the First Sons. This includes, but is not limited to, Alden and Sasha. Alden is sedated and in custody, and Sasha was also captured with the intent to use her toxin to capture Cole for the government's uses. Around the same time, David escapes custody only to find that his wife has died. He pins the death on Kessler, but seeing as Kessler has also died, he goes after Cole instead. The reason David specifically goes after Cole is because he has a unique ability to sense each person's quote, scent, and Cole and Kessler, seeing as they're the same person, had the exact same scent. Going back to Zeke and Cole, they kept talking as they always have done, and Zeke explains how he was treated when he left Cole for Kessler. He basically says that Kessler kept him as a prisoner, but made sure he was actually safe. He also occasionally came in drunk, and in the last few days of his life, Kessler thanked Zeke for being such a good friend. This humanizes Kessler for Cole, and makes him realize that he is no longer controlled by the actions of him. At this same time, Moya instructs the government to raid Empire City in order to capture Cole because he is a useful asset. Cole then tells Warden Harms to get his officers ready for the impending war, and it devastates the entire city, resulting in hundreds of deaths, but of course, all those deaths are covered up. When the military reaches David's location, he easily kills dozens of them, and then he retreats to try and go after his real goal of revenge. Moya calls Cole and offers him a deal. He must turn himself in or risk the fate of the whole city. Cole ponders what to do, but suddenly, David attacks the police station that they're in and almost kills both him and Zeke. Moya, wanting to study and use Cole, instructs the military to save him from David. 
They do so by blowing up a building which temporarily traps David in rubble. Cold then asks Zeke for the keys to his apartment so then he can be alone in case of another attack because he doesn't want to put anyone else in harm's way. While staying at the apartment, Cole looks at the image that Kessler had of him and Trish on his wedding night and he finally gets to mourn the loss of what he could have had. Cole quickly falls asleep, but when he is woken up, the military is completely surrounding him. They toss a gas grenade into the building and Cole immediately recognizes the feeling. This is the exact same gas that Kessler had attached to the balloons at the end of the infamous one game and it caused Cole to suffer hallucinations. During these hallucinations, Sasha contacts him and tells him that he must escape. Cole does so by jumping out the window, where Zeke and Warden Harms see it happen and they go to rescue him, but it doesn't work out completely and he is taken and sedated by the military. David has since escaped the rubble and sees Cole being taken away by the military via helicopter to the shipyard. Cole is then awoken by the sounds of Sasha, who informs him that she will do anything to keep him safe. Moya also tells Cole that they need to have a long discussion, and this discussion consists of Moya basically trying to convince Cole to help her and the government, but Cole's not having any of it. He doesn't trust the government, and he definitely doesn't trust Moya. She then pulls out a device and says that if he does not cooperate willingly, she will put this device on his neck, and he will be forced to do anything she says. Meanwhile, Zeke and the Warden are concocting a plan to break Cole free using a group of policemen. David is also making his way to Cole, but in his path are some guards. After killing them, he goes to kill Cole, but it turns out Sasha has escaped and has helped Cole do the exact same. David senses Cole leaving and takes off after him. Moya knows this and in order to save Cole, she releases a little project she and the agency had been working on. Using First Son's research, the government had made three of their very own conduits that they controlled. Moya sends them to save Cole and to stop David. This works and Cole says that David, quote, pissed off the wrong people. Sasha, now free, makes her way to kill Moya. Moya, sensing this will happen, sneak attacks Sasha with a pipe and tells Sasha that she should have left when she could have and now she is going to kill her. Outside, the military conduits are fighting David. Cole is knocked out and Sasha retaliates against Moya. David kills one of the military conduits by absorbing his energy and Sasha then escapes Moya at the same time that Zeke helps Cole back to his feet and they run away to see David kill the other two military conduits. Cole thinks back on his past life before he got powers and how he walked away from everything that was difficult, but not now. Now, he is going to finally defeat David once and for all. He does this by covering David in fuel and setting him on fire with a lightning storm which finally puts an end to him and causes the ship to sink. Moya is sitting there watching all these events unfold and because she has absolutely nothing left, she tells Cole that with one single phone call, she will make his life hell. But just as she's saying those final words, she gets trapped and the ship continues to sink into the water where Cole cannot jump in to save her. With Moya finally gone and the situation mostly resolved, Cole goes to relax with Zeke. But of course, as Cole and Zeke are sitting on the couch, just relaxing and watching the news, he gets a phone call from a woman named Lucy Quo. She says that she works for the NSA, that she knows about the beast, and that they need to talk. Quo eventually makes her way to Empire City, and there she talks with Cole and Zeke about her past and Cole's future. She explains that because of her contacts at the NSA, she has been given other connections to people inside the First Sons. This is how she knows about the beast and also how she has befriended Dr. Wolf, a scientist who worked on the early prototype of the race sphere. According to Quo, Wolf can help Cole become even more powerful than he is and more powerful than the beast, eventually maybe even defeating it. Cole and Zeke both suspect no ill intentions with this plan and agree to travel with Quo via boat down to the city of New Marais. Quo, true to her word, immediately gets the quarantine blockade lifted just for them and they plan to leave the city ASAP. But at the very worst time, just before they can set sail, the beast emerges from thin air and Cole is forced to try and stop it. He puts everything he's got into the beast, but it just keeps coming back and slowly it drains Cole's powers. In one last ditch effort to stop it, Cole summons a lightning storm and the beast is temporarily destroyed, but Cole is also thrown into the water, now seemingly powerless compared to his previous self. Zeke and Quo help him onto their boat and they begin to travel down the coast to New Marais like previously planned. They then watch the news and see the beast re-emerge in Empire City. 
In a true show of power, it destroys the entire city, and slowly, it started to make its way in a destructive path down the east coast. With nothing but time on their hands, they each work on their respective projects. Quo runs the ship and tries to plan things out for the future. Zeke, still in an effort to apologize to Cole, helps him create a weapon that focuses Cole's powers that he calls the Amp. And finally, Cole gets to work on practicing with it and trying to grow his now limited power set. Once they arrive near New Marais, they find that a militia controls the city and that includes anything going in and out of it. Because of this, they decide to take a smaller boat into the swamps of the city to stay undetected. This is where Cole first learns about a man named Joseph Bertrand, the leader of the militia and an anti-conduit activist. After finally making it through the swamp, Cole, Zeke, and Quo enter the main city and get a call from Dr. Wolf. He says that the militia have taken a thing called a blast core from him, and now Cole needs to get it back. After doing so, he talks to a worried sounding Dr. Wolf, who suddenly falls silent. Just then, Cole sees a giant explosion in the distance, and he races towards the source of the explosion, eventually finding Dr. Wolf hidden in the rubble. Luckily, Dr. Wolf is not fatally wounded, and he explains two very important things to Cole. The first is about a very important device called the RFI, or the ray field inhibitor. It is essentially an anti-ray sphere as it takes away powers instead of dishing them out. Dr. Wolf explains that Cole could use the RFI to subtract the beast's powers, but only if he himself is powerful enough. And that leads him to his second talking point, which is about the blast core that Cole collected from the militia. He quickly explains that blast cores are basically just batteries for the fuel that causes all genetic mutation, and that by passing a current through it, Cole could gain even more abilities and therefore grow strong enough to use the RFI after he's used about half a dozen of them. Knowing what's at stake, Cole immediately uses the blast core he has and gains a new ability at the cost of draining his energy, causing him to black out. Cole eventually wakes up to find Zeke was protecting his unconscious body, but that apparently Wolf had been taken by the militia shortly after he fell unconscious. Quo instructs Cole to practice with his new powers while she looks for him, and Cole does as instructed, trying out his new ability, as well as expanding his more basic ones. After a while, Quo mentions that Joseph Bertrand, the leader of the militia, is holding an anti-conduit rally at St. Ignatius Cathedral. Quo makes it very clear that getting a hold of Bertrand could be the key to finding where they took Wolf, so both Cole and Zeke hide amongst the crowd at the rally, trying to listen in. Hearing what Bertrand has to say, it is very clear how much he actually hates conduits. He thinks of them as dangerous scum that are cursed, and specifically calls out Cole as a devil disguised as a false prophet. He also calls for the citizens of New Marais to take action themselves and report or kill any conduits they see, as that's the only way of keeping them safe. Just as he says those final words, a man in the crowd spots a monster lurking in the scaffolding above Bertrand. The crowd scatters, and Cole is left to defeat both the militia and the monsters as Bertrand makes his getaway. Cole quickly makes work of the situation and has just enough time to chase after Bertrand, eventually making it on top of his vehicle. Cole immediately questions Bertrand about Wolf's whereabouts, but Bertrand doesn't seem worried at all. This is for good reason, as before Cole can notice, he is knocked off the car by a helicopter, and after destroying it, Bertrand is long gone. Both Cole and Zeke, seeing these swamp monsters in action, really put things into perspective for both of them. Now, they fully understood why the militia had gained so much power in this city. Shortly after, Quo contacts Cole and informs him that she has another lead on how they might find Wolf now that Bertrand is back in hiding. This lead takes the form of Wolf's interrogator, who currently is gambling at a casino. Cole is tasked with following this man, and he unknowingly leads Cole right to Wolf's location. Cole clears the area of both militia and swamp monsters, before Quo shows up in a truck to rescue Wolf. Cole then stands in the bed of this truck, protecting it from the persistent militia forces for a while, until eventually, they do the unthinkable. In a last ditch effort to either capture or silence Wolf, the militia rammed a semi-truck head-on into Quo's truck. This badly injures Cole, but luckily threw him out of sight. The others, however, are not as lucky, and from a storm drain, Cole is forced to watch as the militia take Quo as hostage while Wolf is confirmed dead. For the next few hours, Cole continues to hide in the storm drain before finally getting a call from Zeke, 
who says he has found a possible location for where the militia may have taken Quo. He points Cole to the outskirts of the island that is actually more swamp than city. Apparently, the militia have been spotted there recently and Cole makes his way to each small shack looking for clues on Quo's whereabouts. After searching multiple areas, Cole is distracted by an explosion he hears in the distance. There, he meets a fellow conduit named Nyx, who is holding a blast cord. Unlike Quo, who is more uptight and strict, Nyx is about going against the grain and appeals to Cole's more rebellious side. Cole then helps her destroy Bertrand's militia banners in exchange for her blast cord. After agreeing that it would be best if he and Nyx kept in touch, Cole headed back to Zeke's new rooftop hangout spot to use his blast cord, but just as he arrived, found that Zeke had a new crazy plan. True to his nature, Zeke said that he had joined the militia and planned to track Quo down from the inside. Cole quickly remembered back to the last time Zeke switched sides and questioned if his intentions were truly as noble as he said they were. Zeke, in an effort to deflect, said that that was all behind him and told Cole to use his new blast core. Cole did just that and when he woke up got to test out his new ionic vortex ability that could wipe out dozens of enemies with ease. Shortly after this test however, Zeke told Cole to get back to the rooftop because Nyx had arrived and he found Quo. Back at the rooftop, Zeke informed both Cole and Nyx that Quo was being held in an old cane plantation that Bertrand had on lockdown. Nyx was immediately familiar with the location and suggested suggested that they blast a hole through the militia's defensive by using an explosive and a vehicle. Zeke thought that that might kill some of the prisoners inside and instead suggested that they should free some cops to help them raid the plantation. Cole ultimately decided to help with Zeke's plan and together they freed some cops who helped them liberate the building. Upon entering the facility where Quo was being held, Cole saw that she had gone through hell, that they had drained all of her blood and replaced it with quote, God knows what. But this mystery substance somehow activated her latent conduit gene, giving her the power of ice. The militia also took this opportunity and used her powers to infuse soldiers with it, just like the government did back in Empire City. When Cole freed Quo, these ice soldiers also escaped, but for now, Cole's only goal was helping Quo get back to safety so everyone could get some much needed rest. After waking up, Cole was contacted by Zeke about a girl who was being abducted by these swamp monsters. Cole eventually found her and escorted her back to her uncle LaRoche. LaRoche is the leader of the resistance, the rebel group that fights for the freedom of New Marais now that they lost it due to the militia. Because they both had a common enemy, Cole and LaRoche decided to work together from now on, but first, Cole showed off his powers by fighting a giant monster called the Devourer. Once the monster was defeated, Cole met up with Quo in the Numere Cemetery, and there, she explained that she was scared of using her new powers, and Cole knew exactly what that was like, so he taught her how to control them the best way he knew how, by taking out some bad guys. But there was also a specific reason for the location that this was at. Quo looked through all of Wolf's notes and found that there was a blast core hidden somewhere inside the cemetery, and after some searching, they eventually found it, and Quo found her new confidence with her powers. In order to use this new blast core, Cole went to meet up with Zeke, who he saw had been snooping around the militia, searching for the very machine that was used to give Quo powers. Zeke says that he thinks he may have found the next spot that they were taking it, but that he'll need to wait to be sure, which makes now the perfect opportunity for Cole to use his new blast core. Cole does so and eventually wakes up finding that his new ability is more like an upgrade to his already existing ones. He gets upgraded static thrusts, the precision bolt, and the ability to launch high into the air when jumping off a car. Nyx then called Cole and told him that she wanted to show him something at the edge of the swamps. They both headed for a boat and made their way to something that Cole thought was all too familiar. Hidden where absolutely nobody would have thought to look was a crater that looked almost exactly like the one Cole woke from in Empire City. Nyx retells the story of how she stumbled upon this area one day and saw Bertrand at the center with the ray sphere. She says that he was surrounded by a bunch of local outcasts and freaks, people that nobody would miss if they were gone. Within all those people were Nyx's family, and she watched as Bertrand activated the ray sphere, turning both her and him into conduits. Just as Nyx tells Cole this, he has a dark thought. If Nyx was at the edge of the blast and got as powerful as she was, then Bertrand, the hypocritical human purist, must be nearly unstoppable. Cole and Nyx then headed back to the main city where Zeke called for a group meeting. 
In this meeting, he said that the transference device that was used to give the ice soldiers Quo's powers is in Fort Philippe. Everyone present is in agreement that they need to get to the device, but there is disagreement on what should be done once they have it in their possession. Nyx thinks that they should use it for themselves and share powers to even the playing field, but on the other hand, Quo thinks that it should be destroyed because if it falls into the wrong hands, only bad things can come of it. They each also have their own plans for how to get LaRoche's rebels to side with them and help them raid the highly protected fort. Nick says that she wants to dress up as a member of the militia and go on a massacre before eventually Cole would swoop in to save the day and therefore get the rebels to side with him. Quo has a more sane approach and says that they should help get the rebels some much needed supplies, therefore gaining their trust so they might help. The main supplies they, and everyone else needs, is antibiotics, because the original plague from all the way back in Empire City has still continued to spread, even with the quarantine in place. Obviously, being the hero he is, Cole chose to side with Quo, and after helping the rebels get medicine, LaRoche and his men agreed to assist in the assault on Fort Philippe. The main plan for the raid is for Cole to help Quo take out the malicious turrets on the north side before Cole shifts to helping Nyx on the south side. This whole time, the rebels would take out the main militia troops, and then with the fort cleared, Cole could look for the transference device. The raid begins and it all goes mostly as planned, with Cole, Quo, and Nyx eventually clearing out all the militia and finding the device. While looking at the transference device, Cole sees that in the middle sits a blast core and at both ends there is a contraption used to either swap or copy powers from one or both sides to the other. Immediately, he sees the blast core and decides that it's best if he uses the device to swap powers with Nyx, because after all, he needs to defeat the beast and to do that he needs more blast cores and having some of Nyx's powers couldn't hurt. Nyx is very excited at the premise of sharing powers with Cole, but Quo immediately gets upset and changes her mind. She decides that if Cole is going to swap powers with someone no matter what, then it should be with her instead. Cole turns to think about who he wants to swap powers with, but after a quick decision, decides on Quo. They both instantly strap into the machine, trying to get this process over with as soon as possible, but activating it causes tremendous pain for the both of them. First, you see Quo's powers get transferred into Cole, but before the opposite can happen, a helicopter swoops in to destroy the machine. It then flies to the other end of the fort, where apparently Bertrand was hiding out this whole entire time. It picks up Bertrand, but before it can get away, Cole blasts it out of the sky, and then passes out from the stress of the blast core. Cole wakes up to find Bertrand survived and is on the run. He also discovers that he has unlocked some of Quo's ice powers, giving him a larger set of ice-related abilities. However, if Cole would have decided to merge with Nyx, he would have gotten different napalm-based abilities. Cole immediately travels all the way to Bertrand's helicopter crash site, trying to find some clues on his whereabouts, when he hears a booming roar. He goes to investigate the sound's origin, only to find a giant swamp monster the size of an entire building. After a long citywide fight, Cole stops the monster assuming that it was just a distraction so Bertrand could get away, but it turns out that the monster was Bertrand. Cole was the only person close enough to see this and was alone in seeing Bertrand get away and travel to Floodtown. With the help of Zeke and LaRoche, Cole made his way to Floodtown where both LaRoche and Zeke wanted help to power up the city, take out some swamp monsters, and fix the broken wells. In exchange for this help, LaRoche gave Cole a blast core that he had stored away, and Cole made his way to the train car that they called home on this side of the city. When Cole enters the train car, he finds that both Zeke and Quo are there as well, and Quo explains something she found when looking through Dr. Wolf's journal. She says that originally, the RFI was actually a device built to cure the plague that is caused by overexposure to rayfield radiation. Cole thinks back to previous events that have happened and has a revelation. The first cases of the plague had only happened after he had activated the ray sphere back in Empire City. This means that he alone is responsible for the deaths of tens of thousands of people because he caused the plague. And if it was left uncured, he would be responsible for millions and millions of more deaths. Obviously, now that he knows he was the cause of the plague, he wants nothing more than to cure it as fast as physically possible, so he immediately grabs the blast core he just got and activates it. After waking up, Cole immediately tries to use the RFI to cure the plague, but finds that he's just not powerful enough yet. He then exits the train car, testing out his new lightning rocket ability before getting called back in by Quo. Inside the train car, Cole, 
Quo, Zeke, and Nyx all discuss a plan to get Bertrand. Quo brings up the fact that she's been tracking Bertrand's movements and he has been frequently going into a train yard warehouse at random intervals, although she has yet to find a reason why. Nyx says that she thinks she knows why and explains that Bertrand's conduit gene does not just allow him to become a giant swamp monster, but create and tame the normal ones as well. In fact, she says that anyone can tame one as long as they spend enough time with them. When everyone questions how she knows this, she explains that she's actually done it before and that one she tamed even risked its own life to save her. It's very evident in her voice that she had a deep bond with this creature and she tells Cole that they should work to build an army of them to defeat Bertrand. Quo doesn't immediately buy Nyx's story and suggests that they go and collect evidence against Bertrand to defeat him in that way. Cole, of course, sides with Quo, and together they collect picture evidence against Bertrand and broadcast it for the whole city to see. As these images are being broadcast to the public, Bertrand sees them on the news and begins to make a mad dash for solitude. Cole would chase after him, but right now, the innocent people Bertrand is holding as prisoners are more important and need to be set free. While releasing them, Cole encounters Nyx, who has decided to go solo and tame some of her own swamp monsters that she sees as her family. Of course, Cole thinks that that family dynamic is a little bit weird, but more than that, he doesn't like that she didn't stick to the plan, but Nyx is very adamant that one day they will come in handy. After this whole ordeal was over, Cole got a call from Zeke who had some very, very important news. Cole travels all the way to their agreed upon location where he learns of Zeke's crazy, insane, maybe idiotic, and crazy plan. Apparently, Bertrand didn't like the idea that one day one of his experiments could go so wrong that nobody could do anything about it, so he just had a small insurance policy that he always kept in his back pocket. This, of course, came in the form of a nuclear missile that Zeke was now going to use to stop the beast. Of course, Cole just goes along with it and helps Zeke take it to the harbor where he had previously set up the targeting system for it. From there, they launch the nuke and watch the light show commence. The overwhelming force of the shockwave from the nuke knocked both Cole and Zeke unconscious for a bit, but they didn't care. They had finally gotten rid of the beast, or so they thought. Shortly after their awakening, the beast had re-emerged from death, and it was clear that this monster would not be able to die by any mortal means. Because of the urgency of the situation, Cole felt that it was his responsibility to keep moving forward, so in an effort to stay busy, he powered up the final part of the city. This is cut short when at the final Transformer, Cole stumbles into a trap that Bertrand had set up. Contrary to what you might assume, Bertrand doesn't immediately have hostile intentions. Instead, Bertrand actually tries to recruit Cole to team up with him now that the beast has entered New Marais as it might be their only chance for survival. Cole of course refuses, accurately predicting that if he did go along with the Alliance, Bertrand would probably betray him the first chance he got. Bertrand did not like this answer and ordered Cole to be finally executed and disposed of now that he had no way of escape. The militia guards immediately began shooting at Cole, but when all hope seemed lost, Zeke came to save the day. Cole thanked Zeke for saving him and finally forgave him for what happened back in Empire City, noting that he always had his back, even though he had some slip-ups. Zeke is very appreciative of the apology, and now they're both finally back to being more than just friends their brothers. Almost immediately after leaving, Zeke gives Cole a call, noting that he actually almost forgot why he was headed to Cole's location in the first place. He says that through one of his militia contacts, he found a possible location for a new blast core. Cole takes this information and makes his way to multiple warehouses where he fights tons of ice soldiers and an ice titan. Eventually, Cole finds the hiding spot for the blast core along with Bertrand's personal briefcase. Inside the briefcase, he discovers Bertrand's real agenda or at least a part of his real agenda. Both the creation of the ice soldiers and swamp monsters was not just a tactic to help Bertrand's public perception in New Marais like previously thought. The whole situation is actually a trial run for Bertrand's real plan to sell militarized conduits to the highest bidder. This would completely ensure his success and he would be able to earn more money than anyone could ever imagine. But something felt off to Cole. If Bertrand was so money hungry, then why does he donate so much of it? Why would he go through all this effort to be loved by the public if he only really cared about money? Something had to be missing. Some piece of the puzzle that Cole had yet to discover was still out there, but eventually he was going to find it. For now, Cole just needed to relax. 
It had been a while since he got some actual rest, so he headed over to the roof where Zeke was waiting for him. After hanging out with Zeke, watching some TV, and taking a short nap, Cole woke up and used the blast core he had recently found, which, just like all the other times, sent him into another nap. Waking up, Cole found that he had the ability to use his lightning as a tether to pull himself to distant objects. Soon after, Cole, with the help of Zeke, began to go around destroying Bertrand's conduit shipment boats to try and stop his warmongering monopoly. While disabling the final boat, Cole overheard an eerily familiar voice behind him, one that he thought he would never hear again. Cole turned to see that John White was not only alive, but was standing right in front of him. But that's impossible, right? He died back on that pier when the race sphere exploded, and after Cole escaped, there was nothing left to save. John doesn't deny this, and says that after his death, he had to literally pull himself back together, atom by atom. This act was very, very difficult at first, but after some time, he eventually returned. Granted, he did have a bit of a change in his perspective. John suddenly reached out to touch Cole, and upon contact, Cole could now somehow use his ability to sense electricity to also sense the plague from within people. John set out to show Cole his new perspective by guiding him to a warehouse that was turned into a makeshift medical clinic because of the plague. Here, Cole searched for a woman who held the conduit gene, which he could now also see from within people just as he saw the plague. He attempted to revive her, but because she had the plague for so long, she was beyond saving. That is, until John showed up. He said that he had a way to save, not just her, but all conduits from the plague, but it came at a great cost. John suddenly began to transform. His eyes glowed like an orange flame, and Cole instantly recognized what John had become. John White was the beast. This sudden activation of his power caused a massive explosion that knocked Cole out of the way and killed everyone inside the warehouse. Everyone except that one conduit girl. She was completely healed and her latent conduit gene had been activated, giving her the power of flight. Watching the girl fly away, Cole realized what the beast was up to. He was not just a mindless killing machine meant to destroy all that was. He was a walking race sphere that would force evolution cure the plague, and save all conduits, but at the cost of humanity itself. Soon after this revelation, Zeke and LaRoche gave Cole a call that was as urgent as it was important. They said that they had Bertrand's current location, and that other than the possibility of him turning into a 50-foot monster, they had taken out all of his plans of escape. Cole immediately made his way to Bertrand's location, and while talking to him, he finally got that last piece of the puzzle. This entire time, Cole thought that Bertrand's crusade was about respect. Then, he thought it was about money, but really, it's about disgust. Bertrand hates conduits, himself included. He thinks that they're an abomination and wants nothing less than their extinction. But to Cole, this begs the question, why turn yourself into a conduit if you hate them? Suddenly, the realization comes to him. Bertrand became a conduit, foolishly thinking that he was going to become a glorious and pure being of God's will, but instead, he became a grotesque monster. Bertrand hated himself so much that as soon as he knew what he was, he swore to destroy all the rest of the conduits at any cost. This meant that he had to get the public to hate conduits, enough to either segregate or eliminate them from society. This would be done by mass-producing man-made conduits, selling them, and then making them out to be seen as weapons of war, not actual people. The proceeds from these sales could then go to lobby governments, for the permanent elimination of all conduits as a whole. Obviously, Cole could not let this plan come into fruition, and Bertrand knew what he had to do to survive. He leapt off the building that they were standing on, and turned into his true self. After a very long and strenuous battle that spanned throughout the entirety of the gasworks, Cole, with the help of his friends, eventually defeated Bertrand, and he could finally focus on the bigger picture. He needed to stop the beast and cure the plague. Both of those issues could be solved by just using the RFI, so Cole and Zeke met up so they could get the final blast core. While meeting up and scoping out the location, Zeke went into a random coughing fit. Throughout their time in Numeray, Zeke had been coughing every once in a while, but not like this. This time, it was a lot more violent and lasted a lot longer than just a few seconds. 
Cole immediately stopped investigating the Blast Corps and moved to check on Zeke before using his ability to sense the plague to find that Zeke was in his late stages of infection. Cole solemnly asked why Zeke didn't say anything earlier, but Zeke said that it didn't matter. After all, they only had one Blast Corps to go, and after that, they could use the RFI to cure the plague. Using the thunderstorm that loomed above, Cole searched for the final blast core and eventually got his hands on it. He quickly traveled back to the rooftop and used it, granting him the Ionic Storm ability. Using this ability somehow allowed Cole to sense that something inside of him was finally ready to activate the RFI. Cole headed back to the roof where Zeke, Nyx, and Quo were all waiting for him so they could all witness the end to this very long journey. But before activating the RFI, he first had to inform everyone about the fact that John was the beast, and how he wasn't just killing humans, he was creating plague immune conduits, and he wanted Cole to help him. Understandably, this didn't change anyone's mind, and everyone was still willing to activate the RFI to kill the beast and cure the plague, so Cole still went along with it. He held it in his hands, and using only a fraction of his power, activated the RFI. Throughout the next few moments, Cole, Nyx, and Quo all began to scream in agony as the RFI began to activate. Zeke almost immediately sensed that something was wrong and acted fast, grabbing Cole's amp, using it to swat the RFI out of his hands. The screaming almost instantly stopped as the RFI was finally deactivated, and everyone except for Zeke fell onto the ground from pure exhaustion. Quo was the first to talk, stating that it felt as if she was dying in the most painful way possible. Cole finally spoke up, saying that the RFI wasn't even fully charged, and that Wolf must have set him up. The RFI wasn't just meant to kill the beast, it was meant to kill all conduits. Zeke was of course disappointed by this, but knew that using the RFI to cure the plague would be the only way to save the most amount of lives possible, even if it killed all conduits. While Cole agreed with Zeke's sentiment, he was unsure that the RFI would even fully work, and once again suggested that, while harsh, John's plan might be the only way to save anyone at all. This is when Nyx finally gave her input, saying that she would gladly die to kill the beast, because just recently, the beast killed all of her babies. As usual, Quo disagreed that they should activate the RFI and assured Cole that the only way to guarantee anyone's survival at all is to follow John's plan. As always, it came down to Cole for the final decision. He could either sacrifice all conduits without the full guarantee that the RFI would cure the plague, or side with the beast, and help create a world full of plague immune conduits. Just to be thorough, I will first be talking about the evil path and explaining how that one turns out, then I will move on to the more popular canon ending. Also, just to be clear, this decision that Cole makes to side with John and, you know, side with the beast assumes that from the very beginning of Infamous 1 and the very beginning of Cole's story, you have been playing as the bad playthrough. So if you think about it in that way, then this decision to sacrifice all of humanity actually makes a lot more sense. Cole takes a short moment to think before choosing to side with Quo and the Beast. Nyx obviously is against this decision and quickly takes off with the RFI in hand, hoping to possibly activate it herself. Zeke barely has any words at the moment and just tells Cole that if they ever see each other again, Cole better shoot first. Cole and Quo go to meet with John, but suddenly the power is turned off. Quo goes to deal with that, while Cole and John parade throughout the city, destroying absolutely anything in their path. Eventually, they reach the cathedral, where Cole has a final battle against Nyx for the RFI. Eventually, Nyx is brought to the ground, where Cole has no choice but to finish her off. Upon her death, the RFI rolls away from her body, and Zeke is there to pick it up himself. For a moment, Cole and Zeke both just stare at each other, before Zeke raises his gun, and Cole slowly puts him out of his misery. With the RFI finally in Cole's possession, he destroys it, and with that, any hope of the beast's destruction. Both Quo and John were there to see this, and when it was finally gone, John said that he couldn't continue on this current path. He continues to say that his power takes a heavy toll on both body and mind, and that he should have died a long time ago. He says that it's finally time for him to pass his power onto someone who has unwavering determination and willpower, someone to carry the legacy of the beast, someone like Cole McGrath. Suddenly, Cole was lifted into the air and infused with the power to activate conduits and cure the plague. 
This caused a massive blast similar to the activation of the ray sphere and conduits all over the city began to emerge. While there were only a few, all of them followed as Cole traveled up the east coast to fulfill his vision. Because now, Cole was the beast, and nobody was going to stand in his way. Trying to clear his mind, Cole turned away from both Quo and Nyx to make his final decision. After some thought, he turned back to Zeke, asking if he could fix the now slightly damaged RFI. Zeke says that he should be able to, but that he just needs to find out what's wrong with it. And sensing the situation, Quo tries to steal the RFI from Zeke's hands. Cole stops her from doing so, and before she takes off, she says that they are making a big mistake by not following John, and that his plan is guaranteed to work. Zeke further inspects the RFI and concludes that the problem with it is the broken power regulator, but with some time, he should be able to find a solution. A few hours pass, and with some outside help, Zeke has found how to fix the RFI. He explains that Cole and Nyx must take the RFI around the city to different charging stations that LaRoche has set up, and after a few charges, it should be ready to use. Knowing that there won't be much time for goodbyes, Cole and Zeke give each other one final hug before Cole and Nyx set off to charge the RFI. Along the way, the beast shows up and tries to slow them down, but Cole, having grown in power since their last fight, can hold his own against him. Of course, this all changes when Quo shows up, and now it is just too much for Cole. He can't stop both the beast and Quo from getting their hands on the RFI. Nyx sees this and in an effort to buy time, sacrifices her life to stun the beast so Cole can focus on charging the RFI. Cole takes the RFI to the final charging station atop the cathedral and fully charges it. All he has to do now is press a single button. But at the last moment, as the beast awoke from its stunned state, Cole decided that he wanted to kill it himself. But with the power he got from the full charge of the RFI, this was no fight. Cole easily took down the beast himself and ended his massacre once and for all. Looking as the beast fell to his knees, Cole heard Quo cry in desperation. In her final moments, she confides that she was just scared to die all along, and Cole, being the hero he is, sympathizes with her instead of scolding her. Cole stood directly in front of the beast's fallen body as he held the RFI in his hands. He took a deep breath, and with all of his power, activated the RFI. As the RFI reached full power, a beam of light shot directly into the sky encasing the whole world in a mysterious energy. Nearly instantly worldwide, conduits began dying from the effects of this energy field but also at the same time, people who had the plague were suddenly perfectly okay. Zeke watched all of this unfold as he held Cole's body thinking he was going to go down in history as an unsung hero, but the people of New Marais knew what Cole had done for them. Nearly every single person in the city pitched in to create a shrine in Cole's honor, and it was in that very moment when Zeke knew that Cole McGrath went from being known as the Demon of Empire City to the patron saint of New Marais. And with all the festivities going on in the city, Zeke just wanted some peace and quiet, to finally be alone with Cole. As they set sail, Zeke reflected on how the world viewed conduits, that somehow they're two separate things two different groups. But that couldn't be further from the truth, because there isn't anybody in the world with more humanity than Cole McGrath. After Cole's death and the activation of the RFI, it was believed by the general public that he had saved the world, but in doing so made the necessary sacrifice and eradicated all conduits from the earth. However, this is untrue, and actually some conduits survived. This is because their conduit gene had naturally evolved to somehow survive the RFI. Of course, the government knew conduits survived, but in an attempt to hide them from the traumatized world, they created the Department of Unified Protection, or the DUP for short. The DUP was tasked with the goal to detain, or if needed, eradicate the remaining conduits, renamed to bioterrorists, who were popping up one by one every single day. This was difficult at first, but it got easier over the years once they developed ways to find and suppress bioterrorist powers. Finally, around seven years after the activation of the RFI, it was believed all bioterrorists had been locked away for good. This ultimate accomplishment was enough for the government to begin shutting down the DUP and transporting all bioterrorists from the DUP prisons to military owned facilities. The very first transport truck began taking three bioterrorists 
from the DUP's own Curtin K Station to an army prison in upstate Washington. But as you might know, it would never arrive. Delson Rowe is a proud member of the Acomish tribe, and just like Cole, he is an unruly outcast with a rebellious nature. From a young age, he took graffiti as a way to express that side of him, and that is the first thing we get to see about Delson as he vandalizes a billboard atop a fish cannery. This specific billboard features a cop, the symbol of law and order, but just as Delson is finishing up on his artwork, he hears the sound of a police siren and immediately retreats inside of the cannery. Here is where sweet old Betty, Delson's motherly figure, finds him, and while she doesn't condone his actions, she also doesn't hesitate to help him and escape to find an alibi at the tribe's longhouse. Delson takes off to get to the longhouse as fast as he can, but on arrival, he is met by his brother Reggie, who is a police officer. In fact, he's the same one whose face was plastered on that billboard that Delson just vandalized. Reggie begins to immediately scold Delson about his attitude and actions, noting how embarrassing it is having his own brother act the way he does, but Delson is lost in the conversation, too distracted by a truck that is hurtling down the road. Before the truck reaches the two of them, it flips over and you can see two bioterrorists escape. Reggie chases after two, but Delson notices one beside the truck. He walks up to the man on the ground and tries to help him up. This act of kindness almost immediately backfires as soon as Reggie arrives back on the scene, and the man then uses Delson as a hostage to try to escape. Delson, in an attempt to get away from the man, grabs his hand, but as soon as they touch, Delson's fate was forever changed. He began to see a sudden rush of images about this man, none of which made sense to him, but as soon as he came back into his own mind, Delson noticed that he was now a conduit and had almost the exact same smoke abilities as the convict he helped. In an effort to understand what was happening, Delson chased after the man, and upon touching his hand again, he got to see his memories, but this time, he understood them. Delson learned that the DUP were bad news, and if you ended up getting caught by them, you would effectively be treated as a test subject and barely like a human. This struck fear into Delson as now he finally realized that he was on the other end of this bioterrorist problem that had been raging for years. After a quick fight, the convict escaped outside, and Delson chased him only to find a group of DUP agents waiting for them on the other end. This is where Delson meets the head of the DUP, Brooke Augustine, and he finally learns the smoke man's name is Hank, which is short for Henry. Augustine is yet another conduit and a powerful one in fact. She used her concrete powers to detain and capture bioterrorists in an effort to, quote, fight fire with fire, therefore showing Delson how ruthless she really is. On a side note, the DUP has also learned how to instill her power into other DUP agents, giving most of them a small taste of her concrete powers, as well as allowing them to capture bioterrorists with the highest level of efficiency. After showing off her power and seemingly killing Hank, Augustine questions Delson about what Hank might have told him. Delson denies any and everything, but Augustine knows better and gives him a choice. Either give up what he knows, or the tribe gets tortured by her power until he finally tells her something. This is the first karmic choice you get in Second Son, but unlike the other two games, there's not really a canon ending. But seeing as most people that play these games go off the good ending, that's mostly what I'm going to base a story off of, while acknowledging what happens if you do choose the evil side, if it's notably different. Delson decides to sacrifice himself for the sake of the tribe and tells Augustine that he is a conduit, but that somehow he just caught it a second ago from Hank, like it's some sort of sickness. Augustine, obviously, does not believe Delson because of how he phrases it, and she begins to cover his legs from the inside out in concrete. This act puts Delson in excruciating pain, and Augustine, looking for answers, moves on to asking sweet old Betty if she knows anything, before eventually tearing her legs apart with concrete when she lacks a straight answer. Delson then passes out from his pain and wakes up about a week later to find the whole tribe has been completely ravaged by Augustine and her power, but that he is completely healed. Before anything, he goes immediately to find Betty, and she tells him that nobody, including her, are getting any better from their concrete wounds and that they are slowly becoming fatal. With that knowledge, Delson sets out with Reggie to Seattle, 
to get Augustine's powers and to save the tribe. On their way, Delson gains some new abilities with these things called core relays, and once arrived, finds out that the DUP have taken over the city in an attempt to find the other two convicts that fled to the city. Delson sees how utterly oppressed Seattle is and decides that he must help by taking down DUP infrastructure. To make this and taking down Augustine easier, Delson asks Reggie to help him find more core relays to gain even more abilities. Reggie agrees reluctantly, but notes that he is afraid of Delson becoming complacent with his newfound power. Continuing his crusade to cripple the DUP, Delson climbs a space needle and disables their main communications antenna using his new orbital drop ability. He also, true to his roots, vandalizes the big DUP flag that resides atop the needle and marks it with his own symbol of resistance. This, more than anything he's done so far, puts him on Augustine's watch list and she now begins to keep tabs on Delson. With the main DUP communications down, Delson and Reggie can focus on other matters, such as stopping a murder spree caused by one of the escaped conduits. Reggie makes a few calls and finds some of the crime scenes that the conduit has left behind that the cops have cordoned off. Delson goes to investigate many of these crime scenes and comes to two conclusions. One, that the conduit isn't outright evil as he is only targeting drug dealers. And two, he seems to have a certain artistic flair just like himself, but he uses his neon powers to make the art and not a can of spray paint. At the final crime scene, Delson finds a drug dealer's duffel bag and goes to investigate only to almost get hit by a neon blast shot by the conduit from a sniper's nest. Delson chases after him, but he's just too fast and Delson gives up on his chase. He then makes his way up to the sniper's nest and finds that the man in question is not actually a man at all as evident by all the quote girly stuff. Delson also finds the name Brent mysteriously drawn on the wall in neon, and a neon drawing of a face that is assumed to be this mysterious Brent person. Reggie runs the drawing through facial recognition and finds out that it is in fact a man named Brent Walker, a drug dealer found dead with an unknown chest wound in an alleyway. Delson travels to this alleyway and finds an altar in Brett's honor made by the neon girl. In one corner of the room, they find another neon drawing of Brent along with a bag of food from a place named Olaf's. Both Reggie and Delson suspect that the neon girl might be hiding out near the big neon Olaf sign and Delson camps out there waiting until night for her to arrive. Here, he also learns from some bioterrorist protesters that her name is in fact Fetch Walker. When Fetch finally shows up to the Olaf sign, Delson reaches for her hand and upon doing so is granted a brief scrambled flash of her memories and his brand new neon powers. Fetch immediately runs off and Delson chases after her with his newfound ability to run at breakneck speeds. He chases her all the way to an abandoned theater where he finally takes her down and in doing so grabs her hand once more, finally revealing her troubled past. Abigail Fetch Walker was just as surprised as anyone else when her powers randomly emerged one day. Her parents, now fearful of her, called the DUP to take her away, not fully knowing what was going to happen to her. But Fetch was not completely alone as her older brother Brent instead accepted her for her differences and they both ran away, living off what they could for years. While on the streets, they ran into some drug dealers that hooked them up and from then on, she only had one concern getting her next fix. Afterwards, her life was a downward spiral that eventually led to her darkest moment, when she accidentally killed the only other person she cared about, Brent. The DUP easily picked her up after that, but to her surprise, it wasn't a regular prison. They taught her how to shoot, how to kill, and how to control her powers, so on that day of the crash, she escaped with more than enough skill to exact her revenge on the people she saw responsible for Brett's death. One by one, she took down dealer after dealer because in her mind, nobody else should have to suffer like she did with Brent in her darkest moments. Reggie then wakes Delson up from this sudden memory dump and urges him to turn Fetch in because she is a bad person. Delson doesn't accept that now knowing her full past and he has a choice either redeem her and focus her powers for the greater good, or corrupt her, which would be supporting her vengeful past. Delson chooses to redeem Fetch, and together, they find core relays to help Delson get more uses out of his neon power. 
Afterwards, Delson helps Fetch take down some major drug rings by stopping and destroying drug shipments. On the other hand, if you chose to corrupt Fetch, she helps you find and kill the leader of Seattle's anti-conduit rallies. Both of these decisions end with Delson and Fetch, shall we say, having a closer relationship, and she ends up either becoming more merciful or more ruthless. The next morning, Delson gets word from Reggie that the other conduit and Augustine reside in the lower half of the city, so he makes his way to the concrete bridge connecting the two landmasses. Making his way across the bridge, he defeats DUP agents, turrets, and once again comes face to face with Augustine herself. Augustine sternly says that she's been keeping tabs on Delson, and she's heard that he has a new power. Delson denies this, but is forced to reveal his neon power when she sends a highly skilled concrete DUP agent to fight him. After defeating the DUP agent, Delson tells Augustine that he will leave the city immediately, but all that he needs is a small amount of her power to remove the concrete from the tribe. Augustine scoffs at this and partially traps him in concrete, but when all hope seems lost, a mysterious entity picks Delson up and carries him exactly where he needed to go to begin with. After some exploring in this part of the city, Delson gets a call from a fan of his named Eugene. He says that he's a conduit sympathizer and that he's been tracking buses of suspected conduits that the DUP has in a convoy. Delson, in hopes of saving the suspected conduits and maybe getting new powers, stops the convoy and searches for the buses that hold them. A problem arises when Delson can never actually find any of the conduits themselves because they keep being snatched up by the so-called angels that were created by the escaped conduit hiding in this part of the city. Delson asks Reggie for help and Reggie says to meet up with him because he has a crazy idea. Reggie's plan is to put on a vest that is used to mark suspected conduits and for Delson to chase him so that when an angel shows up, they can eventually find where the escaped conduits keep taking them. Delson thinks that this idea is absolutely crazy, but goes along with it anyway, and they eventually find the conduit's hiding spot, just like Reggie said they would. Delson walks inside to find piles of these suspected conduit vests and tons of computer equipment, mostly consisting of monitors. When he goes near one of these monitors, he's taken inside a virtual world where he must fight He Who Dwells, a manifestation of the conduit in his strongest form. After taking He Who Dwells down, Delson comes face to face with the actual conduit, and it turns out that he has actually been Eugene all along. Delson grabs his hand and learns about his past, how he had been bullied all through school, and how he uses his powers to help other conduits from the fate that met him when he got picked up by the DUP. While Eugene was incarcerated in Curtin K, he had been trained to use his video powers for both defense and offense. He could either summon video-based angels to protect him and others, or demons to punish those who he thought deserved it. Delson wakes up and again finds Reggie who thinks Eugene should be taken into custody for kidnapping suspected conduits against their will. Delson tells him that Eugene was saving those conduits from the DUP, and from here, you can choose to either redeem or corrupt Eugene. Delson decides that Eugene is a good kid and leaves him to be for now while he goes to search for more core relays because for some reason he can't use any of his powers and thinks that maybe activating a core relay might help. It does and Delson now had Eugene's unique video powers and just like before he goes to find even more core relays and unlocks all the video abilities he can. With his new video powers, Delson helps Eugene save suspected conduits from the clutches of the DUP, but only if you have redeemed him. If you corrupted Eugene, you both exact your revenge upon a Russian anti-bioterrorist gang. Through both of these paths, Eugene gains his own self-confidence as a conduit and begins to either help save more people or punish those who he thinks deserve it. A while later, Reggie calls Delson, informing him of an explosion that has been spotted near the main DUP tower. Delson investigates and finds a group of DUP agents that have been killed using smoke. Delson, knowing he didn't do it, puts on one of the DUP agents' headsets and listens in to their communications, only to find that Hank, who was previously thought dead, is somehow still alive and out of DUP custody. 
Delson immediately starts chasing after him, and Hank, out of panic, knocks Delson out, but still enters his phone number into Delson's phone. After this, they can contact each other, and Hank reveals that luckily, he escaped from the giant DUP tower, and that the DUP have captured Fetch and Eugene, holding them on a concrete structure that was built between the two islands. Delson asks for Hank's help in rescuing them, and Hank agrees, also noting that they can most likely flush out Augustine from doing this act, and with all of them, there's a very good chance that they can defeat her. Delson thinks this sounds like a great opportunity, and Hank sets a time and place for them to meet up. Delson immediately tells Reggie about this plan and asks for his help as well, but Reggie doesn't trust Hank at all, and says he won't risk his life for just some conduits, so Delson is on his own for this one. After a few hours pass, it is time for Delson to go to this agreed upon location, but on arrival, he finds Reggie, who apparently had a change of heart and is willing to help Delson, stating explicitly that he doesn't care if the ones he's saving are conduits or not. People are people. Once Hank shows up, the tension in the air between him and Reggie is unavoidable. It's a cop versus a convict, and they both don't trust each other, but they still manage to concoct a plan. Reggie says that he will commandeer a boat and go to the far side of the concrete island in an attempt to ambush, while Delson and Hank use their smoke to enter through a vent and go full force on the DUP. On the island, Hank seems very suspicious to Delson, and with every question that he asks, Hank seems to either dodge answering or is very vague in his response. For example, Hank somehow knows about Delson's need for core relays to grant more powers and promises him that there is one on the island. When asked about how he knows this, Hank just dodges the question and tells Delson that they have to keep moving forward and that there's no time to talk. After fighting a suspiciously small amount of enemies, they finally encounter said core relay, but Delson notes that something feels off and out of nowhere, his hands and legs are covered in concrete. Floating up from out of sight comes Augustine, congratulating Hank for successfully bringing her Delson. Hank states that he only did this because she promised him something, and Delson is furious at the betrayal. At this moment, when all things seem to be going in Augustine's way, Reggie comes out of nowhere with a rocket launcher and blasts Augustine away, also breaking Delson's legs free of concrete. With his hands still bound, he and Reggie make their way to safety and get the concrete off Delson's hands, but tragedy strikes as soon as Delson is free, as Augustine traps Reggie's legs in concrete and destroys the ground beneath him. Delson reacts fast and manages to grab hold of Reggie's hand, but the concrete slowly begins to creep up Reggie's body, making him more and more heavy every single second. Before it can finally reach Delson, Reggie says in his last words that he has always been proud of Delson, and that he loves him, and then he lets go of Delson's hand, falling into the dark water below in his final sacrifice for Delson's life. Delson screams out in pain as he watches this happen, and then with everything he has, Delson goes to fight Augustine. The fight is long and difficult for Delson, but at the end of the day he manages to sink the entire island the fight was on, but not take down Augustine in the process as she escapes to her base. Delson swims to shore with one thing on his mind, revenge. He wants to find Hank and make him pay. He does this by tracking the DUP communications that lead him to a dock where Hank is set to leave the city via a boat. Delson captures him before this can happen, and it is then Hank reveals that Augustine was threatening his daughter all along. Delson, still rageful, begins to choke Hank with his chain, but hears his daughter out on the escape boat. Delson, right then and there, has a choice, at the very last moment, to either get his revenge for his brother's death or face the reality that Hank was only doing this for his daughter, and that he might do the exact same thing. Delson decides to spare Hank and let him go free, realizing that he should really be focusing his hatred towards the one who actually killed Reggie, Brooke Augustine. Delson travels all the way to the DUP tower and shuts down the protective electrical wiring that surrounds it, and begins to climb the tower. During the ascension, he's helped by both Fetch and Eugene, who turn out are alive. And as soon as they reach the very top of the tower, Delson breaks through the roof and is finally face to face with Augustine, ready to either expose her lies to the public or kill her and end her reign. After a short battle, Delson takes her down and she surprisingly gives up her power willingly, and in doing so, 
Delson gets to see into her mind. Brooke Augustine was there in Empire City seven years ago. She was one of the many in the military deployed at the time to stop the beast, but when he destroyed the city, she somehow managed to survive, and she was changed because of it. She found another survivor, a small girl, who was also a conduit, and together, they traveled across the lawless wreckage to find safety. After a while, they finally reached a military checkpoint, but turns out the military were afraid of conduits, and they weren't friendly at all, even with Augustine being a member of the military. Right then and there, Augustine decided that she had to make a choice, and she decided that the best way to keep conduits safe was to imprison them so that no conduit would have to die anymore. Right in front of the military, she encapsulated the little girl in concrete, effectively trapping her and gaining the government's trust in the process, and she was then entrusted to keep society safe away from the rest of the conduits. This was the beginning of the DUP and the Curtin K bioterrorist prison where she would capture and hold all conduits. Augustine ran the DUP for years but eventually realized that she did her job too well and the government was just ready to disband the organization altogether due to their newfound sense of conduit security. Augustine could not let this happen in fear for the conduit's safety, so she planned a way for the public to be scared of conduits once more. She picked out three very specific conduits and trained them to use their powers before finally giving one of them the means to make their transport truck crash. Delson, at the end of the day to Augustine, was just a fluke in the plan and depending on his choices was either a beacon of hope for all conduits or just another one of the scary ones the public should be afraid of. Either way, Augustine had an image to uphold for herself and the DUP, and even with Delson's new concrete power, he would be no match for her. Their fight continued, with Eugene finding core relays to give Delson more concrete abilities. Delson struggled in this last battle, but eventually he won, and Augustine finally got a taste of her own medicine. When the dust settled, Augustine was taken away and her DUP empire was torn down. He also freed all the prisoners at Curtin K and they were allowed to now make their own choices and be free. The general public had a perception change because of Delson, and now he was the forerunner in the second wave of how conduits were treated by others. Delson didn't revel in this feeling for long because he had a promise to keep with the ones he cared about most. Delson made his way all the way back to the Akomish Longhouse, where he was regarded as a hero by everyone, but especially by Betty. He was able to treat everyone's wounds, which is something that he thought Reggie would be very proud of. Speaking of Reggie, Delson made sure to correct his prior mistake and repainted the billboard to show that Reggie was truly the world's finest. Of course, that is if Delson chose to be the good guy. He just as easily could have chosen to be selfish, and if that were the case, well, things would have worked out very much differently. When Delson took down Augustine, he didn't just take down the person who killed Reggie, he took down the only other person who could stop him. With nobody in his way, Delson took control of Seattle and destroyed any remains of the DUP before finally making a stop at Curtin K. He let every single conduit go free but not before shaking each and every one of their hands as they were on their way out. But before he could revel in his newfound powers, Delson went back to the Akomish Longhouse to fulfill his final promise. But surprisingly, when he arrived, he found that nobody wanted his help. They all saw how he killed dozens of civilians, and Betty told him that they would rather die than accept his help. Delson could not fathom their rejection. He worked so hard to get to this point, and they just turn him away? But Delson thought about what Betty said. They would rather die than be saved. And he granted their wish and put an end to his past life to make room for his new one as the world's most powerful conduit. <laughs>